From New America and Slate, I'm Bridget Schulte, and this is Better Life Lab. There are some people you know, from the moment you pick up the phone, you're just going to have a great conversation. Even if the phone line's terrible and the guy's describing his favorite way to fix eggs. My favorite way currently to prepare eggs is in the Instapot. And I've been a total Instapot convert for a couple of years now. And the steam basically lifts the shell from the egg white. And so you just pull them off and then you get a nice soft egg white and a beautiful yolk that can be hard or soft boiled. That's David Sbarra. The reason for my call was not to talk about eggs. It was to talk about busyness. Busy with a Y. David's a leading clinical psychologist, but he admits he's got a problem, maybe even an addiction, to busyness. He wrote an article for Vox that included this grim assessment. I'm a robot programmed to obliterate my to-do list. During the day, I direct a research laboratory, write papers, and teach classes as a professor of psychology at the University of Arizona. Come 4.30 p.m., I run a kid limousine service, shuttling between various activities, preparing dinner, helping with homework, and the evening routine. I scurry through these activities, often missing the moments of joy embedded in everyday life, until I have some sort of nightly electrical shortage, then crash out on the couch. I reboot in the morning and do it all over again. I'm addicted to busyness. On this podcast, we look at the art and science of living a full life. And busyness is something I've been thinking a lot about. For many people I know, it keeps stealing time from what we really care about. So I've been asking behavioral scientists exactly why busyness is so compelling and what we can do about it. We'll hear more from David Sparra in a moment. First, though, I want to introduce Dan Arelli. He's the New York Times bestselling author of Predictably Irrational. He's also the founder of the delightfully named Center for Advanced Hindsight at Duke University. And when we think about busyness, the first thing to notice, he says, is the way our environment is designed, at work and at home. When you ask people, how many of you have right now rottening fruits and vegetables in your refrigerator? (laughs) Almost everybody admits that they have it. (laughs) I just took mine out to the compost this morning. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) And it's it's a sad funeral, right? You take all this stuff that you paid lots of money on and you had good plans for, and then all of a sudden you check on them and it's too late. That's true. It's so true. It's so sad. And and the reason, of course, is that it's a bad design. Where do we put the fruits and vegetables? In a low drawer that is opaque. Hmm. Now, now, you could stand there in front of the refrigerator and say, let me examine all my options, including bending down and opening this drawer. And it's not a lot of effort, but it's a little bit too much. Hmm. So because of that, we open the refrigerator and whatever comes at eye level are the things that come to mind. And those are the things that we eat. So I think that what we need to do is we need to figure out how do we design better environments. It's true for the kitchen, but it's also true for the work environment. You know, for me, one of the biggest lessons in social science over the last, you know, 40, 50 years has been that we make decisions as a function of the environment that we're in. You put Mm. people in one environment, they make one type of decisions. You put them in a different kind of environment, they make a different type of decision. And because of that, human freedom is not in our kind of ability to make decisions. It's in our ability to put ourselves into environments that would lead to better outcomes. You know, what I'd love to do now is listen together to a bit of the conversation that I had with David Sabara, who's struggling with busyness and feeling addicted to busyness. So let's listen to his story, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay. I... I don't know. I spent a long time, the last couple of months, trying to figure out what's wrong with me. (laughs) I have a terrific life. I have a a wonderful job, a great career. You know, a, a... I feel like a happy marriage. Our kids are doing fine. Uh, you know, I have every all the blessings in the world, and I feel grateful for them. But I just sort of go around feeling mildly miserable all the time. Hmm. And I felt like I was just running from one activity to the next. And I, I really have tried to hack this up and figure out um, what exactly is going on here. And also really trying to provide for myself a lot of what I talk about. I'm a clinical psychologist by training and I have a psychotherapy practice and I talk with people who are trying to figure these kinds of things out all the time and Mm -hmm. sort of 
step back and look at it in a way that I might sort of advise my clients to do in my practice. And, and that's how I ended up on thinking that I'm realizing, coming to the conclusion that I am perhaps addicted to busyness. Well, everything that you described sounds pretty great. It is pretty great. It is pretty great if you can sort of drop an anchor into your experience of it, but it's, it's just sort of the pace to me is getting like mind-numbingly fast. Mm. And we're trying to also find time to buy a new car in our family. And my son keeps saying, you know, all you have to do is like go in there and, and figure, you know, we know which car I've been emailing. Just go in there. I was like, I can't even think for a minute like a, 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 about doing that. And, and so it just, for me, the, the worst part of it all is the sense of being frayed, like the fabric being frayed or being frenzied. Frayed is maybe like, I don't have the bandwidth for anymore, I'm nearly exhausted. And frenzied is like, I have this monkey mind that is like jumping from one thing to the next and I can't focus, I can't think clearly, I just feel exhausted by the way I'm turning over things because the next thing is coming to the next thing is coming to the next thing. So, Dan, what do you make of that? He talks about feeling addicted to being busy and frenzied and frayed, and he doesn't have much bandwidth. Yeah. So it's actually a combination of many, many forces, and some of them are wonderful, right? So so the, the first thing is that life gives us lots and lots of opportunities. Imagine you were a farmer 200 years ago. You got up in the morning. What are your options? Basically, go and work the field. And you're going to work the field. You know, you can take a bathroom break, but you can eat a little bit. But that's about it. Now, we have a tremendous amount of things that we could choose between. This freedom is amazing, but it also means that we often accept too many things from the beginning. Hmm. So what we have, and, and I'm terrible at this as well, is it's, it's very hard to say no. So what happens is we say yes too often, mm-hmm. and now we have too many things on our plate. And, and it has kind of two elements to it. The first one is we have too many things on our plates, but it's also stressful mm-hmm. because now we need to manage multiple things at the same time. And we spend some time on the management of which one do we do and which one do we don't. And I don't know about you, but when I try to meditate, like, you know, I try from time to time, I close my eyes. In seven to 10 seconds, I get my to-do list, up, <laughs> right? Which basically... <laughs> Which basically come and say, okay, what's on my to-do list? Which one of things I need to make sure I'm not dropping? Right. And, <laughs> and, and what we have is we have a cost that is a part of this management system of, okay, I have 25 projects. Which one do I need to make progress on? Hmm. You know, let's listen again to David Sabara and hear some of the ways he sees contemporary culture driving these behaviors and some of the strategies he's tried to overcome his own addiction to busyness. Everything seems to be about more and more. And, you know, it's publish more. It's pursue more opportunities. Take advantage of more. And I think the inertia of that kind of mindset just takes on a life of its own. And you have to be extremely deliberate to redirect the ship and to really sort of say, hang on a second. What, what is my ideal day? What is my North Star in terms of, like, what, how I want to live my life. Where are the moments and the times when I have been the happiest? I'm not, I'm not necessarily unhappy. I don't want to paint that picture. I, I'm not struggling with a, with a major depression. I'm not experiencing massive debilitating anxiety. It's, it's, it's malaise and wondering, you know, what else is there for me and how can I do this better? Mm-hmm. And I think that's an important time to take stock. So if you're feeling this malaise, you know, this this kind of desire to, like you said, drop an anchor into your experience, you know, it certainly seems that busyness has become, you know, if not a badge of honor, it's certainly a way of life for many people. Um, and, you know, is it a personal thing that we all are just now addicted to it? Uh, is it technology? I think technology is a big part of the, you know, the frenetic sense that we have, constantly checking in and updating and being plugged in, and that creates this sort of vigilance that people have about missing out and foreclosed opportunities. And so, so we're, we're amped up. People are amped up, and they're, and they're revved up. And so that's a big part of it. I also think that we are 
you know, we live in a competitive time and there's, there's competition to succeed and to do more with, with fewer resources, right? So people are really going after uh, what is available for them. And, and then there's a contagion of busyness that, that becomes the social norm without even realizing it's like the air that we start breathing. That's a very hard force for people to recognize because it's like asking fish about the water they're swimming in. Right. You can't even see it, right? right, right. So, uh, that, and, and that's, I think, why it took me so long to really recognize this. The idea that a psychology travels through a network is not a new idea, right? So, loneliness, you know, there's evidence to suggest, suggest only, I'm not saying it definitely is, but there's the idea that loneliness is contagious in a network. Depression uh-huh. certainly is. If your friends of friends are lonely, then you yourself are more likely to be lonely. And you can, you know, we can say there's this contagion. So these social forces and social properties are, are fairly well known. And, you know, that's how these things get conveyed in the culture. I spent some time with a researcher at North Dakota State University who's been gathering holiday cards for decades. And it's amazing. You go through the archive, and every year you just become more and more breathless at at how much stuff people are doing and how they're bragging about it. And and these are people, like, from the Midwest, so it's kind of everywhere now. How do you... um, how do you stop that? How do you get out of that network, or how do you change the contagion to something a little bit more positive? It takes, you know, getting knocked on the head by a little three-pound object <laughs> to to sort of wake you up out of your stupor and say, well, what is what is there that I'm breathing? So I've been reading all kinds of interesting stuff. You know, uh, the SAS Pico Air has a nice book on stillness and quiet. There is a book on busyness already, and, uh, you know, there's a whole community of people, the slow food movement has a, you know, the slow lifestyle movement has a long history. So talk about how you're trying to overcome this addiction. What is your, what is your recovery plan? What are you, what are you doing to overcome being busy all the time? Well, I think I'm trying to be more deliberate in my choices. And that's something all of us can do right away, right? And focus on saying no more and but more sort of trying to focus very clearly on my values and make sure that I'm living in a way that is consistent with those values. And and I think the the antidote or the prescription here, however we choose to think about it, is all of us sort of just taking a pause on this and saying, you know, what are my values? And is there a discrepancy between the guide, the, the principles I want to guide my life and the way I am actually living on a day-to-day basis? And mm. I really just tried to create physical space to, to have more downtime, starting to walk more and be outside because I was losing touch with the sort of experience of being outside and moving my body through space. And, you know, I, I ride, ride a bike quite a lot and I exercise a reasonable amount, but just sort of being outside other times. And I really just focused on going for more walks. And mm. sometimes I listen to books or podcasts, and but sometimes I just walk and I, you know, will park my car maybe a half a mile, a mile away from campus and hoof it in for 20 minutes. And it just, it creates space to just, let your mind be restored by nature and be creative. And, and to me, that's made a huge amount of difference. Just that, just that. That sounds so hopeful, and it sounds so doable. Like, and we Americans are such overachievers. Are people going to like start, you know, like walking miles and miles a day just to try to calm down? Well, we should. We we really should because you know I'm involved in this uh, very interesting series of programs with our. Uh, College of Public Health, and I was sort of learning about the ways in which they've tried to implement diabetes prevention programs. And one of the things that they said is across a lot of the interventions that they've tried, the one lasting sustainable thing for people has been walking groups. Hmm. Wow. Creating groups in which you, you are moving together with other people and you have a time to connect, you have a time to, you know, get and give social support and, and uh, those kinds of things. But you're also moving your body. This is very, this is very sustainable. 
So, Dan, so what do you think? Moving your body, creating space, um, is that part of the answer to busyness? There's lots of evidence that getting into walking groups is very helpful. And the reason, of course, that walking is good and spending time socially is good, but also having pre-commitment to other people is very important. Mm. Right When David just makes promises to himself, uh, those promises are likely to go the way that all promises to ourselves go. But if when we make promise to meet a friend in a street corner, you might not care about your own health, but you do care about your promise to a friend and you're going to show up. But of course, it doesn't really deal with the problem because the only thing it does is it says, let's take an hour and make sure that in that hour we're not tempted. Hmm. It's better than nothing. Uh, But it's not helping us be more productive when we're at our desk. It changes the environment that you're in to an environment that doesn't give you temptation and you're pre-committing to that environment and so on. But it doesn't mean that he's going to say, oh, you know, I I used to work 18 hours a day. Now I have an hour of walking. Let me commit to things that only fill 17 hours. (laughs) So I think it's it's kind of a patch. I think that the right approach is to figure out how to say no and how to do the things first that are important to us. Hmm. Uh, One of the tricks, by the way, we we give people is to say, when somebody asks you for something new to do, imagine that they ask you to do it this week or next week. Now, if you say, oh, look at my week right now. You asked me to come and spend a day in Washington. If I would cancel other things to do that, then go ahead and accept it for April 20th, 2018. But, But if you say, no, 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 it doesn't fit with my priorities, now it will probably not fit in your priorities in a year and a half from now Mm. either. Hmm. So, so think about kind of what what do we pile on our plate, and how do we how do we stop that? That I think is one thing. And you know, the, the, there's a there's a really interesting question of what are we trying to maximize? If at the end of each day you would ask yourself, is this was this a good day? What are the kind of things that you would do? And the kind of things you would do are probably the kind of things that would give you the short term satisfaction. Oh, I I made it to do list. I crossed thing off. I answered all my emails. Mm. What about the end of your life? Mm. How many people at the end of life would say, you know what? I got to inbox zero seven hundred and fifty two times. <laughs> well, that's so depressing. <laughs> I know. The, the things that give you happiness at the end of life are are very different, and and we don't have to go all the way there. We could do the end of the year, the end of the month, maybe even the end of the week. Mm. So what happens is that when we take too many things on. The kind of things that give us short-term satisfaction are not the kind of things that give us long-term satisfaction. There's a word I really love called cancellation. It's the elation you feel when something is canceled. Hmm. When somebody asks you to do something, to go to a meeting, to participate in something, ask yourself how elated would you be if half an hour before that meeting it was canceled? And if you experience this cancellation, just don't don't commit to it from the beginning, right? Because it means you don't you don't really want to do it. So so don't don't get into those situations. And sometimes that sounds easier said than done, right? It is. It is. And one reason why saying no is so tough is that sometimes you say yes to things that you know you shouldn't, but then they end up being wonderful. Mm, that's true. I, I went to give a talk to some VC company in San Francisco. I said, okay, it was in some hotel, 8 p.m. in San Francisco, and I'm driving. Why did I say yes? Like, what compelled (laughs) me at that moment to say yes? And I get there, and I sat with myself. Like, what got me to say yes? And I give my little talk, and after that, we we sit, and I have a drink with the guy next to me. Turns out uh, he's Brazilian, and he asked me, uh, what can I do to get you to come to Brazil? Hmm. This was a couple of years ago. I said, you know, the World Cup is in two months. Get me a ticket to the last four games, (laughs) and I'll be there. (laughs) <laughs> and a week later, I have tickets to the last four games, and it was an experience of a lifetime. <laughs> uh, I got to go to games. I got to go with some of his friends. I got to go with him to some of those things. It was really a wonderful thing. And from time to time, those random things turn out, right. and they turn out well. And I, I personally feel that I'm kind of sometimes gambling with my time. And that's where the danger lies, right? That's so where the danger lies. Let's, let's listen to the last part of my conversation with David Sabara. He'd written this beautiful scene where he was tickling his five-year-old daughter, and he described that as the best half hour of his year so far. I asked him how he got to that moment of connection. This brings the addiction analogy full circle. So with my daughter, I talked about just sort of creating space for play 
just sort of sitting and waiting to see what happens and looking for things to unfold that are not planned and not structured. You know, I, I think the idea of scheduling unscheduled time is really an, a, a good idea. It's like, I'm going to make sure that every night at 7.30 or after we do some, you know, the chores before the kids go to bed, I'm just going to locate myself on the couch and just see what happens. Mm-hmm. And, you know, often quite before I, I give my daughter a bath or something, we will, you know, wrestle a little bit and, you know, she likes to do trust falls into me and for me to tickle her and make faces at her and all the, all the good parenting stuff, right? And, just going through the motions constantly, um, we miss a lot of this. And I, w- I mean, I think from the outside, a lot of people who would see me say, hey, you know, you're, you're connected to your kids. That's, that's lovely. That's a beautiful thing. But I wasn't, I just felt like I was constantly like, there's a routine and there are these 20 tasks and let's get through the routine and you get to bed so then I can, you know, be on the couch and, See who wrote me some emails since the last time I checked an hour ago. And, um, <laughs> That's so sad, and it's so true. <laughs> yeah, and to me, the beautiful thing with my daughter is like she's she's young enough that she wants to be, you know, she wants me to be wrestling with her. She wants me to be tickling her, to hold her in the airplane position, and those kinds of things. And you know, I'm I'm not. There's no way I'm gonna. 15 years from now, feel like I missed that. I'm just not. It's too, that is a value. Yeah. And so can I live close? Yeah. But last night, I had been out from 10.45 in the morning and got home around 7.30, right? So I'd been doing in my clinical practice and then going to give this talk. So I hadn't checked in on email. And there were 70 emails I got during the day. Wow. And I, you know, whatever, that's, that's life. But I felt this absolute urge to dispense with them. I felt uh, uh, like an urge, like an addictive <laughs> urge. I could not feel better, more relaxed, more satiated, calmer, until I cleaned my inbox. And my son was making this, oh, he, he's almost nine, he was making this awesome Lego thing. It's like a tiny house out of Legos he's building, and he's putting it on wheels. Like, but he's building it, and he's trying to finish it, and he's showing it to me. And I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, he's got to go to bed so I can do the emails. And he's like, I'm so close, and he kept perseverating on it. And I was like, you have to go to bed. You have to go to bed. And I was, and I was like, what is this about, man? You know, I don't know if the analogy to an addiction is act, but if it is, then we're talking about riding a wave of a craving. I was compelled to go to do the work because that was, I needed to get rid of this noxious feeling of all the emails so I would do something, right? So the key idea is that you just let that feeling pass without reacting to it. But you have to first try to notice it and see what it is and be able to describe it. And then I just like, I just sat down Indian style and I was like, show me what you have here. Tell me about it. And I don't know how well other people are doing that, Maybe a lot of people are doing that really well. But my sense is that we are missing those opportunities because if it's not running to do email, it's running to do Facebook. Just standing there and your son's doing it and you're like, oh, you know, like, 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 like. (laughs) Maybe, maybe it's just me, but the ability to just sit and say, you tell me what you're doing here. This is really interesting. It's inspired by this TV show about tiny houses and the people live in this thing. Oh, my God, he's got like a bed in there and it's like a, you know, a foot wide and it's pretty cool. So, Dan, you know, here you've got a situation where you've got these 70 emails. You can't think straight until you clear them out of your inbox, even to the point where you've got this wonderful scene with your child in front of you doing something incredibly creative. And all you can think of is (laughs) try to get the kid out and to bed so that you can answer these emails. What is going on? What is wrong with us? Yeah. So so first of all, you know, I listen to this. I say only 70. That sounds like an easy day. (laughs) (laughs) Um. But again, if you think about how email was designed, it was designed to give you a sense of what things have not been dealt with and to make it feel that they are waiting for you sitting on your plate. And and whether you do them or not, the fact is that when you think you could be doing it, it's already taking a toll. And if you know that things are piling on your plate, 
And there are some things that might require your immediate attention, but we don't separate them. They all look just the same. Hmm. Right? So, you know, when, when mail comes to our house, it's very easy to separate catalogs, which we don't need to look at, uh, from, from bills that we need to deal with on a monthly basis, from personal letters. That, you know, we don't get that many personal letters anymore. But, but if you think <laughs> about it, the yeah. form tells you a lot about what it is. Mm-hmm. With email, it all looks the same. Right. So you say to yourself, oh, there must be some things here that are really crucial. So what what we've done is we've taken this pipe of information, of digital information, and we deliver everything from it. But by delivering everything from it, we elevate the importance of lots of things in in a way that is completely inappropriate. So so I think he's right that that we have created that. Mm. But I'll tell you one thing I did. As I travel the world from time to time, I I get to meet chief rabbis. I'm Israeli and Jewish. I'm kind of curious about Judaism. And I always ask one question. I say, if you were recommending to me one commandment to keep, which one would it be? Like, give me one. What, what should I try? And what do you think is the commandment that they all recommend? You tell me. Keep the Sabbath. Interesting. And they all said the same reason. They say, keep the Sabbath. It seems like you're making yourself less productive. It says, take, take a day off. And instead of working and, you know, progressing, don't do anything toward your actual goal. But instead, what it does is it gives you a chance to reflect on life. Mm-hmm. And they say, if you take this time and you reflect on life, you'll actually make higher progress. It's kind of interesting because it fits some of the research in social science of what's called depletion. That if you keep on working very hard all the time, you get mentally exhausted. And kind of having some time to reflect on life and think about what you want to do might actually be very useful. I talked to the chief rabbi in South Africa about this, and he wakes me up very early the next day. I I think the guy has too much energy, but he wakes me up very early in the morning. He said, let's get all the Jews in South Africa to celebrate the Sabbath. He said, how do you do it? And we start talking about what do we know about getting people to adopt a new habit. And, And the final decision we made was not to build up for it, but to start with one day a year of people doing the full thing. Hmm. Right. And, and, and the reason, you know, if people have to think whether they want to spend time with their family on be on their iPhone, even having that thought is going to diminish the capacity and their enjoyment of what they're doing. Mm, that's so what, true. what people need to have is the idea that there is no email. It's just not possible. And if you're a religious Jew, of course, it really helps if you think God really cares about whether you read email on the Sabbath or not. But if you do... And it's out of the system. It's not tempting. Hmm. There's actually a, a really amazing piece of research showing that when you take Orthodox Jews and you check how tempted are they to smoke on the Sabbath, they're not tempted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and on a regular Wednesday, if you tell them don't smoke, they're craving the nicotine. On the Sabbath, they're not. There's a higher order need that says smoking is just not an option here. <laughs> And we, we studied this, uh, what happened on the Sabbath that we tried out. And what happened is that that was the feeling that people got, that all of a sudden they were fully engaged because it's not just that they were not checking email. They knew that it was outside of the rules. And it's kind of an interesting thing to, to think about is what kind of rules should we create for modern society so that we don't tempt ourselves to misbehave? I love that thought. Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Dan Arelli. He's written three books on decision-making and irrational behavior, two of them New York Times bestsellers. Dan's a professor of psychology and behavioral economics at Duke University. At Duke, he also leads one of the most amusingly named research centers on campus, the Center for Advanced Hindsight. We also heard this episode from David Sabara. He's a professor in the psychology department at the University of Arizona, where he directs the Laboratory for Social Connectedness and Health. David's recent article for Vox is titled, I Trained Myself to Be Less Busy, and It Dramatically Improved My Life. For more resources on working healthier, visit us online at newamerica.org. Click on the link for Better Life Lab. Better Life Lab is produced by New America in partnership with Slate. Thanks so much for joining me for our podcast about the art and science of living a full life. It's a collaboration with Ideas42, supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Our podcast is produced by David Schulman. 
If you enjoyed this episode, here's one more item for your to-do list. Take a moment to review Better Life Lab on Apple Podcasts. It really does make a difference in getting the word out. From New America's Better Life Lab, I'm Bridget Schulte.